I am not an astrophysicist. <laughs> but for the past three years, I've been attempting to construct a scientifically accurate fictional universe from scratch using nothing but pen, paper, and basic mathematics. This process of constructing imaginary settings is known as world building. And those who world build are known as world builders. On my YouTube channel, Artifexian, I've been encouraging others to become world builders by showing them how to create believable galaxies, stars, planets, planetary systems, moons, and even languages. So to give you all here today a sense of what it means to be a world builder, I thought it would be a neat idea to construct an entire planet for you in this very TEDx talk. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Fair warning, there will be maths. Uh, and I'm liable to get really excited when I see numbers, so I apologize in advance, and I thank you for indulging this math-loving nerd. Anyways, constructing an entire planet seems like an impossible task. Where do we even begin? Well, science tells us that a planet's surface gravity, mass, radius, and density are all related like so. I call that fella the planet builder because like, you literally take numbers and chuck them at it and it spits out fully functional, scientifically accurate planets. Like, let's say this world we're going to create today has a surface gravity exactly equal to Earth's. But let's make it a slightly smaller world, say something that's about 80% the radius of Earth. It follows then that its mass must be about two-thirds the mass of Earth and its density about 20% greater than Earth. Fine. But what does this all mean? They're just numbers, right? How is this even remotely related to anything at all? Why are you subjecting us to this, I hear you ask? See, the thing we don't learn in maths class is that numbers tell stories. And in this case today, they're going to paint beautiful vistas of imaginary worlds. So we have to ask the question, what's the story behind these numbers? So the first thing that pops out of me is this low mass value. There's less actual stuff in the planet we've just created. But the stuff that is there is quite dense. So perhaps our little world is a world pregnant with the materials needed to drive rapid technological advances. Heavy metals, rare earth elements, and so on. And, because of our planet's small size, any advancements made both technologically and intellectually could quickly spread across the globe. Circumnavigating the planet, for example, could take less time less effort, and crucially, could cost less money. Ideas and innovations might propagate on this little world of ours at a rate unfathomable to us Earthlings. Moreover, our planet's escape velocity, how fast we need to be going in order to break free of the planet's gravity, is about 90% that of Earth's. The lower the escape velocity, the easier and cheaper it is to launch spacecraft. So not only could our little world allow its inhabitants to rapidly accelerate up to the point of becoming a spacefaring civilization, its relatively low escape velocity may give them the incentive needed to step out into the cosmos an awful lot earlier than we did. This little world of ours, it could be a world littered with robots and spaceports. But this is just one interpretation of the numbers. Many other creative impulses lie hidden within these numbers, waiting to be uncovered. 
That said, any and all points are sort of moot at this stage, because without a star, our planet can't have life. Starlight is the fuel on which life runs. No star, no life forms, no robots, and sadly, no spaceboats. So, it's incumbent upon us, I think, that we have to build a star, no? Star building is even cooler, sorry, hotter, than mana building. Check this out. Let's say I have a star that's 1.1 times the mass of our sun. If I do this, I generate its luminosity, how bright it is relative to our sun. This, its temperature. This, its radius. And this, its lifetime, all relative to our sun. How awesome is that? Like, using just the most basic of exponents, I'm able to literally determine the physical makeup of a celestial object. And this holds every time. A star 7% more massive than our sun will have these characteristics. A thought occurs. We've got two stars here. Could our planet orbit both of them? Like this, perhaps? Answer, totally. Twin suns or binary star systems are abundant in the universe, and astronomers have even found <coughs> planets orbiting in this exact configuration. Now, we can't place our little world arbitrarily close to stars. It's going to get fried. Nor can we place it arbitrarily far away, lest it die an icy death. See, we want life forms and robots and spaceports so we're going to need to place our planet at a distance such that it can have liquid water on its surface. Because life needs water. Or at least life as we know it. Now if you're a nerd like me, you're going to start asking yourself, well, what is this distance? Turns out, it's that. And again, note the really basic mathematics. In our case today, our little world will need to orbit about 1.63 times the distance Earth orbits the Sun. So if we imagine this is the Sun, and this is Earth, maybe about there for scale, we have a little bit of wiggle room. We can move it a little bit further out, which might result in it becoming a cold world, perhaps covered in global tundra. Or we can move it slightly further in, which might result in it being a warm world, a dry world. For the sake of expediency, I'm going to keep it where it is and turn it into a desert planet by placing it about here, which is pretty much as close as I can get it without discarding the notion of scientific plausibility. Now with all that in the bag, it is time to go back to the 1600s and talk to this cool dude, Johannes Kepler, who came up with this equally cool formula. Now this is one of my favorites. If, if we take the distance our little world orbits its stars, and the sums of the masses of those two stars, we get, wait for it, the length of a year on the planet we've just created. 304 Earth days, like how awesome is that? But like. What does it all mean? They're just numbers, right? How is this even remotely related to anything at all? Why, oh why, oh why are you subjecting us to this? I hear you cry. And that's a valid question. That's a very valid question. But let's say, let's say you and I were to set foot on this planet. Stepping out of our stargate or whatever, we'd be immediately struck by the glory that is the twin suns. And the intense heat. And the fact that daytime on this planet would be kind of weird. Like, we'd experience a mega bright day when both stars were facing us. A somewhat dimmer day when one eclipses the other. And a dimmer day again when the situation is reversed. And if we lingered a while, we'd notice that anything pertaining to the seasons, hibernation, 
gestation, migration, seasonal festivals, that sort of thing, would seem rapidly accelerated due to the planet's short year. And there would be hordes of wandering robots and sweltering spaceports. Imagine such a world. Imagine how cool it would be to experience such a place. Look what we've achieved with just the most basic of mathematics. Imagine how cool it would be to, to, to know this place, to feel this place. But the really cool thing is that we don't need to imagine. We all here likely have experienced this place. We all know what this place is. We all have, in a way, been there. Would anyone like to hazard a guess as to what this place might be called? Any takers? Uh, I, excel in, I excel in the art of subterfuge. This, this planet we've created today is called Tatooine. <laughs> this, it's Tatooine from Star Wars. This entire time, all I've been doing is outlining the mathematical model that underpins the Tatooine system. Tatooine is, for the most part, scientifically plausible. It is 0.82 times the size of Earth. Its surface gravity is exactly equal to Earth. Therefore, its mass is that, and its density is that. It orbits two scientifically plausible stars whose masses are that, and it does so in 304 Earth days. And if you permit me to just be ever so slightly self-indulgent here, Q, E, D. Done, proven, mic drop. Uh, this, and if you don't believe, if you don't believe me, I invite you, no, I implore you all to go to Wikipedia, and that genuinely is a thing, <laughs> and verify my claims. But regardless, this Tatooine realization should hopefully give you some idea as to why we world builders do what we do. We create fictional worlds for use in our works of fiction, be it for our novels, games, films, or TV series. We construct imaginary places to bring plausibility, scientific accuracy, and or internal consistency to our creative works, so as to provide a more immersive experience for our audiences. But this is not why I build. I build purely to learn and to pass that which I've learned onto others. I am a lifelong autodidact and world building satisfies my info cravings. Like in order to pull off this Tatooine build, I had to learn about planetary science. I had to learn about stellar astrophysics. I had to learn about oral, orbital mechanics. And the list goes on and on. World building, for me, encompasses every aspect of the human experience. And this is why I do what I do. I create secondary worlds so as to better understand this world, our world and my place within it. So my name is Edgar, and I am not an astrophysicist. <laughs> but one day, soon, I'll be applying to go back to college with a view to becoming one. And I have Tatooine to thank for that. Thank you.